Buon pomeriggio, eh, ben ritrovati al nostro quarto appuntamento webinar organizzato da Mondadora Education in collaborazione con Macmillan Education. Mi chiamo Silvia Petrosillo e lavoro a Macmillan Education Italy. Oggi ospiteremo il nostro esperto di pronuncia fonetica e suoni legati alla lingua inglese Adrian Underhill. Adrian è anche autore di un nostro manuale sull'insegnamento della pronuncia inglese eh, che si chiama Sound Foundations, edito da Macmillan Education. Um, il webinar avrà una durata circa di tre quarti d'ora e a seguire Adrian risponderà alle vostre domande. Potete redigere i vostri quesiti durante il webinar stesso compilando l'apposito form che già vedete ora alla destra del vostro schermo. Uh, inoltre la registrazione di questo webinar e le slide saranno disponibili dai prossimi giorni sul sito di Mondador Education e entro una settimana, a partire da oggi circa, riceverete per email il vostro attestato di partecipazione. Vi ringrazio per partecipare a questo webinar e vi auguro una buona visione. So, thank you Adrian for being with us and it's over to you now. Hello everybody. Uh, this is Adrian Underhill. I hope you were expecting me because here I am. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here with you uh, for this webinar. And this webinar, as you probably know, is called Presence and Performance. And we are going to look at some things that you can do with your students when their pronunciation is good enough or quite good. And these are things that you can do anytime with any class at any level. And I think you'll find this uh, very interesting, not just for students, but for oneself, for teachers, for anybody, in fact, because this is something about how English works. And what we're looking for is how to help students to be comfortably intelligible, to be intelligible comfortably to their listeners. Because pronunciation, the actual sounds that you use, are not everything. There are other things to be done. So what we're going to do now uh, is to um, have a look at some slides and I'm going to take you th through it, 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 two sections. The first is a little bit about the background to uh, this approach to pronunciation so that you can understand where I'm coming from, what I'm thinking and make sense of everything everything that follows. And the second bit is this class activity that you can do, as I said, anytime, at any level, and with any group of students. So the first thing I'm going to do now is to take you through the first few slides, the introduction to this approach, and then we are going to look at the main part, which is this class activity. So now I'm going to bring you to my screen so that you can see my PowerPoint, I hope, which is here. So hopefully you can all see my PowerPoint, which says presence and performance in speaking. <coughs> okay, here's the first page. And that's what the, te uh, the topic is about, presence and performance. In more detail, It's about the performance of the speaker, and it's kind of about how the speaker can take care of the listener, help the listener by drawing the listener in and by being comfortably intelligible, as I said before. Comfortable intelligibility is more important than good pronunciation or anything else. We are here to understand and to be understood, but comfortably, without difficulty. And in specifically, what will we look at? It's this. The use of unstress, and of course stress, but especially unstress, as you will see. Pausing, phrasing, and sense grouping, and joining words. And I'm going to show a very simple exercise which does not require any technical knowledge of pronunciation, but which benefits everybody. We're also going to look at rhythm, Uh, varying speed and voice tone. And when we have attended to these things, 
I invite my students to feel the meaning of what they say, because feeling the meaning helps intonation to, uh, to become more present in one's speaking. So that's what we're going to do. Now, here are the, uh, I think, four slides, which are uh, about the basic approach to pronunciation, which I'm taking, which is not exactly a mainstream approach, though I think it's a very commonsensical approach. And see if you agree. Here are five statements. The first, which I've kind of already said, but let me say it again. Pronunciation is not the end in itself. That's not what we are here for. Sometimes it seems like it, and sometimes that can be helpful. But more important than pronunciation is intelligibility in connected speech, <clears throat> especially easy intelligibility or comfortable intelligibility. Second thing to say, which you kind of know, I expect, is that pronunciation is everywhere. It's in everything. You can never get away from it. It's in all four skills. Clearly, it's in speaking and listening. Pronunciation is also in writing, because when you write, you think inside your head of the language. And when you think the language, you hear it inside your head. And when you hear it in your head, there is a pronunciation, an inner pronunciation. So even when writing, all of us are pronouncing the words that we are. Uh, rehearsing in our minds before we write them. Likewise, when we read, nearly everybody, when they read, subvocalizes. That is to say, they hear the words and the pronunciation in their heads. Now, you may not always do this with your first language, it's quite true if you are very fluent, but almost certainly all of our students do that when they are learning a second or third language. So that pronunciation is always happening inside their inner ear. This means that whatever you do, you are doing pronunciation. Even if you never teach pronunciation, you are doing pronunciation from the first moment of your lesson until the last. You can't get away from it. The only question is, which pronunciation are you doing? Are you helping students into the new one of the new language, or are you letting them default to the pronunciation of mother tongue. So, as I said, then every activity is also a pronunciation activity. One more point I'd like to make, in fact, two points. First, I say to all teachers, teach your accent. If you are worried about your accent, don't. Teach how you speak, speak how you teach. And this is true for all speakers in the world, expose your students to multiple other accents from different countries and different regions. It's very easy to do now, of course, through the web. Uh, there's lots of opportunities for exposing students to different accents. And the last thing I want to say, there is a difference between knowing about pronunciation, you read books, you look at diagrams, and proprioceptive knowing. Now, proprioception, it's a Latin word, so perhaps you guys already know this. Uh, it's, a, it's not a common word in English. It, in English, it's from um, the field of neurology. And what it means is that you sense the muscles you are using. You can feel the muscles that you are using. And that is the sense that we need for pronunciation, because pronunciation is physical. It's an inside physical activity. It's not like grammar. It's not like vocabulary, which you can do with your cognitive mind. It's more like dance which you have to do with physical coordination. So that's uh, a lot of what I do, is the physical coordination of the pronunciation muscles. Well, now, there's an introduction. Let's have a look at uh, the basic of this approach. Uh, <clears throat> you may or may not agree with this, but this is my point of view, that our current methodology is a bit detached from the physicality of pronunciation. This is really what I've just been saying. Uh, we are dominated by cognitive representations of what goes on in the mouth, whereas what we need is the physicality, embodied pronunciation. And to do that, we need to contact four muscle buttons. Number one, the lips, which don't move a lot. They spread, they go back, 
they round and go forward, or the tongue, which goes forward and back, but it can also go up and down and it can curl a little bit round. The jaw, which simply goes up and down with the tongue in it, and the voice, which can be on and off. And those four muscle buttons are, of course, being used by everybody in every language in the world every day. By habit, to learn a new language, you need to come back and reconnect with these four so that you can get them to do different things that are not part of the habit of the mother tongue. So connecting with these four is the important thing. And really, if you can reconnect with these four, you can begin to make all of the sounds of all of the languages. <clears throat> and this is a little tip for teachers. Unless you know what's going on in your mouth, it's very hard uh, to help your students. You need to look in your mouth, see what you are doing, then you can go and help your student. If you don't know what's happening in your mouth, you can only say, repeat after me but you can't help the student any more than that. So uh, here are uh, the, the final two slides that I want to show you about this method. There are two solutions to what I think are two problems. And I think uh, problem number one concerns the physicality that we, as I've said before, I'm now saying it again, uh, that we uh, teach pronunciation cognitively, not physically. So the problem number one is, uh, well, the problem number one is not that pronunciation is physical, but that we teach it cognitively when it should be physical. It's like teaching dance by talking about it um, or by reading a book. Uh, the only way you can teach dance is, is by moving your body and looking inside to see what the problems are and having a teacher who also moves her body uh, to see how to help you. <clears throat> pronunciation is the same. With grammar and vocabulary, you don't have to do that. You can think it. Grammar is like a sort of a kind of algebra, a sort of problem solving. It, that approach doesn't work for pronunciation because it's physical. So what's the solution? Clearly, teach it physically. More like teaching dance than teaching grammar, as I said. <clears throat> and the use of proprioception, that is sensing what the muscles are doing. Uh, you cannot escape the habit of the mother tongue by repetition. Once you've escaped, then repetition is helpful. But until you escape, repetition is no help. Problem number two, or solution number two, is the pronunciation chart. The problem is that pronunciation seems kind of mysterious or endless. You know, what is it? How much is there? How do I get hold of it? How do I catch it? Is there a map? With grammar books, I look in a grammar book. With vocabulary, I can look in dictionaries. But where is, where do I look? Where is the map of pronunciation? And the solution is the Sound Foundation's chart. Uh, this is a kind of geographic map, a visible thinking tool. And what it shows, all in one look, this chart, this pronunciation chart, it shows you in one look, one gestalt, all the sounds for all the words and all connected speech in English. Shows you how and where sounds are made, how the sounds shape each other, and how all the sounds are needed from the beginning. You can't have a syllabus with sounds. You need everything from the beginning. So that's a map, and here is the map. Now, as we look at the map, you can perhaps see my cursor and what I'm going to do is just to take you on a very quick guided tour. What you're looking at <laughs> is English. And here is the front of the mouth. Top teeth, bottom teeth. Here's the back of the mouth, top of the mouth, bottom of the mouth, center of the mouth. Now, with the mouth fairly closed and the tongue forward, we get this sound. As we move the tongue back, we get these other sounds. Open the mouth a bit tongue forward. As the tongue goes back, we get these other sounds. Open the mouth a bit more. As the tongue is forward, we get that. And move back, we get these other sounds. So this one is E, and this one is O. And if I go E, and what's happening as I do that, sorry, what's happening as I do that uh, is that my tongue is going back, 
And this is the thing about English. My lips are going forward. So my tongue goes back. And as I'm doing this, my lips go forward. In English, it's the opposite way. Tongue goes one way, lips go the other. If I open my mouth a bit more, eh, eh, if I open a bit more, ah. So there are the sounds. Here are the diphthongs. And as you can see, they're grouped according to the final sound. Here are the consonants at the front of the mouth, back of the mouth. So here are the sounds which stop p, b, t from the front of the mouth to the back of the mouth. Here are the sounds which you can continue because they're made by friction, f, sh, and so on. Front of the mouth, back of the mouth. Here are the nasal sounds that come through the nose. Front of the mouth, well, here are the three nasal sounds, front to back. And here are sort of some bits and pieces. Uh, these two, which are kind of like vowels, they're called semi-vowels. These three, which are for linking words in connected speech, and we'll come back to those in a moment. And these two, uh, which are kind of linked together, l and r. They are kind of cousins, and in fact, they are thought in some languages to be the same sound. In European languages, they're different sounds. So there is a chart, and when you look at this chart, you're seeing all the sounds, you're seeing all the sounds that are needed for all the words, and therefore you're seeing all the sounds that are needed for all of connected speech too. This is everything. There's only one page. There is no page two. It's page one, the end. Grammar books have hundreds of pages, dictionaries, hundreds of pages. But this is page one, and that's it for pronunciation. There is only this page. There isn't any more. So it's, <laughs> it's pretty simple, really. What you're playing with are just these 44 bits. Uh, half of them, at least half of them, are the same as in Italian. So that's not so difficult. Now. Uh, this is the chart that I use for teaching with, and you can find more about this uh, using my app or on the Macmillan website. And that is, uh, that is the kind of map of sounds that I use for sounds and for words and for connected speech. But I'm not now going to refer to that. I'm going to look at uh, presence and performance on the basis of that. A little guided tour that I've taken you on about this approach to pronunciation and this chart here that we're looking at. So now we're into part two. And in part two, I'm going to show you a technique and I for which I choose a little bit, a little passage of English. It can be from anywhere at all. A newspaper, a course book, a letter, something off the web, a poem, a play. I've taken, uh, just for this uh, example, something from intermediate or in fact pre-intermediate, a book that uh, you probably know far from The Madding Crowd <clears throat> by Thomas Hardy. I've selected a paragraph from page two. And the reason of, for having a text is that when there's a bit of text, the students don't have to choose the words. So we can uh, do some activities with the words without the students having to worry about what the words are. When they've tried these activities, we will then, a bit later, of course, apply them where there is no text, where they are making up the language as they speak. But first, let's have the support, the scaffolding of a text. So here's the text that I've chosen. Oh, wait, wait a minute, let me say something about this. I, this is not the text. Um, first, uh, I would select a text and I would probably do all the usual activities with it first. So, for example, the grammar activities, the vocabulary activities, the language activities. Then I'm going to use it for these things. And this is what I'm going to show you now. Sense groups and speed, stresses and energy distribution, schwa and mumbling, linking words, feeling the meaning, 
and presence and performance. So now, uh, here is my text. <clears throat> this is from um, the second page of that reader, far from the madding crowd. As you can see, it's just a description. It's a descriptive piece. There's no dialogue. It's nice to have dialogue, but to begin with, I just take something quite simple. And if you look through that, you can see that you might use it perhaps first for a little bit of grammar. It's about the past tense. There's the senses of seeing and hearing. There's a bit of geography, a hill, stars, sky, and so on. It's setting a scene. So when I start to do this little activity, which takes about 15 minutes, it can, can be done in less. <clears throat> we start with a text. It's nice to start with a text that means something, whether it's a dialogue, or a descriptive piece. Now, my aim is going to be to get my students at the moment, that's you, the people who are listening to me, to say, even to perform this little text in a very delightful way, in a way that will captivate your listeners, in a way that is kind of like storytelling, in a way that is speaking from your heart, not just from your head. Here's step one. I say to my students, well, we know this text. What I'd like you to do is to divide this text into sense groups. And they say, what's a sense group? And I say, well, sense group is nothing very special. It's not technical. There's no right and wrong answer, but a sense group is the words that seem to go together to make a sense. So we look at the first line and I say, well, can you see a sense group there? Which words go together? And probably, even if they don't know quite all the words, people are pretty good at seeing what goes with what. So probably they're going to look at that and they say, yeah, I think the sense group might end there. It was nearly midnight. <clears throat> and then I say, OK, what's the second one? And say, well, yeah, on the 21st of December. Yeah, OK. Very often punctuation, of course, is at the uh, edge of a sense group. And I say, well, what do you think is the third one? And they say, the shortest day. Or some people will say, the shortest day of the year. And of course, both are possible. There's no exact correct answer. Um, we might have very short sense groups like this, the shortest day of the year. We could make them longer, the shortest day of the year. There's a tendency, as you know, I'm sure, the more fluently one is speaking, the more words there are in the sense group. But even so, even if you speak very slowly, it's fine as long as you group the words into sense groups, like I am at the moment. I'm speaking with some quite long pauses, but my words are in sense groups, so it makes sense. Here's an example of a nonsense group, a, a group that doesn't make sense. If I said, it was nearly midnight on the 21st of December, the shortest day of the, and you can see that's a nonsense group. Whereas it was nearly midnight on the 21st of December as a sense group. So when we've chatted about that a bit, I say to my students, well, you've got your paper in front of you, uh, uh, chat with the person next to you and put a line where you think the sense groups are. And this is not difficult and usually they agree with each other. And this is what it might look like. You can see here that I've put a blue line between the sense groups. And I've also written out 
21, the number to be as in words, 21st, since we need all the syllables. So we put a sense group there, 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 there. I think there's about nine or 10 sense groups here. <clears throat> um, for this activity, though they will have the paper in front of them, I will have in front of the class this text on whatever equipment you have, whether it's a whiteboard or blackboard um, or interactive whiteboard or flip chart, it doesn't matter, but I will write out this text. Uh, I will leave some space between the lines and you'll see why in a moment. And then we now, I will now negotiate with the students. Where's the first sense group? Oh, it's here. Where's the second one? Oh, it's here. Get a student up to the front with a pen or a chalk to put that, to put in the sense groups. Good. What we've done now, in a very simple way, is to, by asking the students where are the sense groups, they've had to look at the text, feel the sense, and use their own knowledge or intuition to see which words go with which. And that's the beginning of everything. That's the beginning of everything in uh, intelligible, comfortable speaking and listening. Once they begin to do that, we are started. The second step is going to be this. It's terribly important in English. Actually, it's important in most languages, but it's most certainly important in English. I say to the students, um, now then, how many syllables in this first line? They are one, two, three, four, five, okay, six. That's a good question because it gets, when I just say how many syllables, it makes them think, slow down the words and really notice what the syllables are. And then I say, if you are speaking this or reading it aloud, which syllables are going to be stressed? And I'm assuming that we have already spoken about and discussed stressed syllables when learning vocabulary. And they're probably going to say, well, near and mid. They're probably going to get it right. If they don't get it right, maybe say midnight, that's fine. We can work on it for a moment. Of course, when there are two syllables, any word with two syllables or more, one of them will have to be stressed. So we know that nearly we know that midnight, mid, is going to be stressed. And I say, what about the next uh, sense group? Where will you put the stresses there? And they might say, well, yeah, I think it's twin. And, and then we'll play here. Maybe, the, maybe they're not quite sure, so we'll have to find decem. It's on the second syllable. And I draw a little line on the board underneath each stressed syllable. And they may think that's stressed as well. Okay, let's put it in. So we stress three syllables there, two syllables in that sense group. And here, shortest day of the year, shortest day of the year. Okay, so three stresses. So I say, go through the rest and mark the stresses. And they do that for a moment, perhaps with their neighbor. And then someone comes up to the board and we mark the board and we discuss which are the stresses and which are not. And we get something that looks like this on the board in front of us. <clears throat> so now we've got the stresses. We're not distinguishing between a word stress. For example, in this word on its own, the syllable has to be stressed and you will find that in a dictionary. We're not distinguishing between word stress and sentence stress, which is what I call speaker stress. That is the stress that the speaker chooses to put in order to convey his or her meaning. So we get both stresses, but it's speaker stress or word stress, we put them here. And as you can see, right across this text now, we've put in the stress syllables. My next question is gonna be, well, which in each of these sense groups, which is the most important stress? If you could only have one, which would it be? So now we're beginning to play with two stresses and seeing how it feels, how it alters the meaning. It could be, it was nearly midnight. It was nearly midnight. Or it could be, it was nearly midnight. 
nearly midnight. Now, in both cases, I stress both, but one is the speaker stress, the strong stress. And we have to negotiate with the class, which is it to be? Well, for the moment, I'm going to have the main strong stress, the primary stress here, which is nearly midnight. And then I haven't done it here, but I'll draw a little box. Can you see there? So that we distinguish that strong stress from this one, which is a stress, but it's not as strong as that one. So now we can say the first phrase, something like, it was nearly midnight. It was nearly midnight. And generally there is a tendency to put a, a, a movement of intonation on the one which is uh, the stronger. Then we go on to the next, on the 21st of December. And I say, well, where do you want to put the, the main stress, the primary stress, the strongest stress of all? On here, the 21st of December, or 21st of December, or the 21st of December. All of them are possible according to your meaning. But usually uh, we agree on one which is a kind of standard, straightforward, and usually in English, but certainly not always, it's typically uh, the last stressed syllable in a sense group. It's not always that, so don't, it's, don't rely on it. It's a guide, uh, not uh, an exact rule. What about this one? Shortest day of the year. Uh, let's put the main stress there, shortest day of the year. Well, that's possible if we're looking at lengths of days or Shortest day of the year. That's possible if we're thinking about nights as well. Shortest day of the year. Well, that's possible if we're thinking about years, but it's also the neutral, normal, most likely stress. So we're going to put it there. So here is our main stress. There's a box there, the box there. There's a box here to show that those are the strongest stresses. Now we've got two, oh, look, four. No clouds in the dark sky. This could be two sense groups, of course. It could be there were no clouds and then a second sense group in the dark sky. But here I've put them together into one. There were no clouds in the dark sky. And stress, 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 stress. And what I'm going to do for the purposes of the exercise is to have the, the box, the strongest stress here. Likewise here, and the stars were shining brightly. The stars were shining, there's definitely stresses. The stars were shining brightly. That's the strongest. It was not the sound of the wind, not the sound of the wind that travelers could hear. Again, stress there. On Norcom Hill, stress there. It was the sound of music. Now you'll see that as it happens in this particular text, I've chosen and I'm sure you probably agree, uh, in every case, the last stress syllable to be the strongest stress. It doesn't have to be like that. And it doesn't matter if you choose differently. <clears throat> now, before we leave this and go on to the next stage, here's a little activity that I do with my students. I ask them to say only the stressed syllables, near, mid, twin, first, Sam. And then I ask them to say that as if it has real meaning. Near, mid, twin, first, sem. So they are getting used to discriminating between stressed and unstressed syllables. In this case, the game is to not say the unstresses and to say the stresses. Of course, we don't speak quite like that, but that's a great help, as you'll see, for the next stage. Here's the next stage. We've been looking at stressed syllables, but what about the unstresses? And it's the unstresses that really are, believe it or not, rather important in making English comfortably intelligible. So now we'll focus on the unstresses. And... In particular, I'm going to, I will have already uh, discussed with my students, we will have studied the unstressed vowel, which is, has the name schwa, uh, and the sound is simply uh. And you can make uh by 
completely relaxing tongue, jaw, lips, and cheeks. Uh. If you have any tension in those muscles, you will change the sound. And this is my question to my students. Which syllable, which of the unstressed syllables in this line have the sound schwa? Just uh. So they look through. This is a good exercise because they're hunting for sounds. That means they're having to say the words and they're having to be discriminating about what the sounds are. It was. It was. And I say, is that one? E, e. Is that the same as uh? No, it's not. So that's e, but this is uh. So we have, this is a schwa here. It is nearly mendite. Oh, is that schwa? Oh, not quite. The. There's one. The. 21st of. D. That's not one. So, b. There's one. So when they've got the hang of it, I say, look through your text and mark and chat with your neighbor. The syllables that you think are schwa. So then they do that, and then we have the next uh, display on the board up at the front. And when we add the schwa sounds to the text, then it'll look like this. Now, we don't exactly have to agree. There's no, again, there's no right answer. Um, <clears throat> it was nearly midnight on the 21st of December. The shortest, yeah, that's, that's in the wrong place. Look, it shouldn't be day, it should be there. Shorter, shortest day of, that one should be there, the year. There were no clouds in the dark sky and the stars were shining brightly. It was not the sound of the wind that travellers could hear on Newcombe Hill. It was the sound of music. So I, I'm not sure, about 20, 25 times you get schwa there. Now, I think there's about 20 stressed syllables. There's about 60 syllables, so that leaves 40 unstressed syllables. And schwa is 50% of them. That's typical. Schwa is the majority of unstressed syllables. So now, here's our text, and we're preparing it for this fluent speaking. So now I say to my students, I'd like you, please, to whisper all the unstressed syllables and to only say aloud the stress syllable. So it would come, we have to do it slowly. It's like this. It was nearly midnight on the 21st of December, the shortest day of the year. There were no clouds in the dark sky. See? So again, they're getting used to reducing the energy on the unstressed syllables. And they get some help, which is that all of these syllables, surprisingly, are schwa. And often my students say, but that's not correct. It's not correct if we reduce these vowels to schwa. And I say, well, it is correct. That's how English works. Even the smartest accents that you could imagine will be using a schwa in all these places. Otherwise, it would be hard to understand them. I hope that you are understanding me fairly clearly, but if we were to write down what I'm saying, you would see as many schwa sounds in my speech as there are here on this page. So this is the next step then. I'm going to practice this phrase as if it was one word. And I'm going to help them, it was, it was, and then it was nearly. And I say, take your time, it was nearly midnight. You can take time on a stress. It was nearly midnight. But look how short that bit is. It was, it was, it was nearly midnight. It was, it was nearly midnight. So much longer, so much more energy on the stresses, especially the strong stresses, the ones with these boxes, the boxes that I haven't written underneath. <clears throat> and the next one, on the 21st of December. We're stressing these 21st December, but this is the one which has got the box, the strong. And these other ones on the, on the, on the, it's nearly nothing. You mumble them on the, 
on the 21st December. And this is the extraordinary thing which students find difficult to agree to at first, especially if their own language doesn't do quite the same thing. If their own language gives uh, um, more prominence to all of the syllables, then they find, they think that this way of speaking English is not proper, not correct, but actually it is correct. And not only is it correct, but it's easier to understand. So uh, I ask students to whisper the unstresses and speak. It, it was nearly midnight on 21st December, shortest day of the year. There were no clouds in the dark sky and the stars were shining brightly. You see, we take it quite slowly and we can take it slowly because we are spending very little time on these schwa words. They are de-energized. They're de-energized. And that's how come uh, people often say that the English are swallowing their syllables. Well, it's quite true. When students say that, they are completely right. And in fact, it's something to learn how to swallow <laughs> syllables. Well, there's an exact rule to it. You swallow the syllables that are not stressed. And uh, to help you do that, a great many of those are schwa. So this is the uh, fourth step of preparing the text. We've done the sense groups. We've found the stresses. We've marked the unstresses in. And now the next step is going to be to link all the words together, the next and final step. Uh, remember, there is the schwa sound which we were looking at all the time. If I just go back a moment, it was nearly midnight. Let me just show you the vowels. It was nearly midnight. It was nearly midnight. Those are the vowels. And if I just go back again, on the on the twenty first of December, let's just take that on the on the twenty first of December. On the twenty first of December. We're always returning to this in spoken English. Now let's take the last which I mentioned just now. <clears throat> Here, I've asked the students to go through connecting up all the phrases and looking for any sounds that are needed. And you see, we've had to put in three sounds to help link. And you remember that I said uh, that these were the three linking sounds in English, r, w, and y. Well, here in this linked up text, you can see them, day of, day of, sky and, here on, here on. And these are uh, linking y and linking r. So now the exercise here is just to join all the words together inside a, a sense group. It was, it was, it was nearly, it was nearly midnight. It was nearly midnight. Unstress, it was stresses near mid. It was nearly midnight. It was, it was mumbled, like mumbling. It was, but this is so strong. It was nearly midnight. And that is what gives English its rhythm and its texture and its sound. You take plenty of time on the stresses and you take no time at all uh, on the unstressed. And now this is the game with my students. We've prepared the text. We've arrived at the point of putting together the fluency. And I say, look, start here. And you can stop here as long as you like before you continue. But all of this inside sense group must be joined together as if it is one long word. It was nearly midnight doesn't even have to be quickly. It was nearly midnight. Here, 
on the 21st of December stop the shortest day of the year stop there were no clouds in the sky there should be a line there and the stars were shining brightly so very slowly we've now got to the point where we have the sense groups so that gives them a unit of language a little chunk to rehearse as one word they've got the stresses which are going to be the energy points and which really carry the meaning they've got the unstresses which enable them to give a lot of contrast between unstress and stress helped by the constant use of the vowel schwa and finally i'm saying now join it all together so that each of your phrases is like one word connected up. And they practice that on their own. They practice it silently. I get them to look at this text and without moving their lips to hear inside, in their mind's ear, these words connected up and this and this. And they hear the reading. And then I say, now, you're going to say it yourself in a moment as if you are telling a story. Don't speak aloud, but prepare it inside using your mind's mouth, your, your inner mouth, so to speak. Taking into account all the things we've just been practicing. And then I say to them, right, now you're going to say it aloud. And I'd like you each to turn to your neighbor and to tell them this most beautiful little paragraph in a delightful way but first to do that i say can you picture the scene what can you see in your mind's eye it's dark it's december the shortest day of the year what does that feel like no clouds it's dark but we can see no clouds it's a dark sky and we can see stars because there's no clouds they're bright it's cold and bright and maybe there's a wind sound, but actually what we can hear is something else. We can hear music. We're on a hillside. It's dark. It's probably cold. We can hear music. So I get them to feel that. Can you feel that into the words? Can you feel the meaning? Because now you see, now that they have joined up the words and they have some sense of stress and unstress, now they can begin to feel the meaning. And now that they have stress and unstress, the intonation can at last begin to enter. It's very hard, in fact, impossible to have intonation, useful intonation, without the words connected together and without the stress and unstress. Each of these little sense groups is a kind of intonation package. So I say to them, you've now done all the connecting up. You can feel the meaning. I would like you now, please, to delight your neighbor and to read that passage. And that's it. That's what we do. That's really uh, the end of this exercise. And I do this exercise uh, quite frequently with different texts, and they get quicker and quicker at it. And they gradually begin to find that they can have this idea in mind, even without a text in front of them. In other words, it gradually transfers to ordinary spoken English without a text. Well, that's that. I hope you found that very interesting. And I hope that if you haven't tried that, you will. And that if you have tried something like that, you will do so uh, with even greater enthusiasm and greater delight uh, in the output of your class of students. Here is something which I find very useful. It's my app. This, of course, is the pronunciation chart. And this is the ordinary keyboard. This is for use on a smartphone. And you can download this from the App Store. It gives practice in all four skills. Uh, you hear the sound. In this case, uh, you see the word and you try to find the sounds. In this case, you see the sounds and you try to find the spelling. But it also has listening and speaking. And this is called Sounds, the pronunciation app. Uh, it also, you can dial up American English or British English, and you can use the American chart or the British chart. I also made an American English chart. Listen, speak, write, and read. 
Uh, here's a picture of the chart when I was in China. And as you know, things in China can be quite large, including pronunciation charts. And here's me trying to teach pronunciation on this very large chart. And you see, I can't even reach the vowels. So this lesson, <laughs> this lesson was mainly about consonants. And last, uh, if you would like to know more about any of this, go to my blog, which is here. There's the app, which I mentioned. Uh, the pronunciation charts on paper you can get from uh, Macmillan Education. Uh, here are some videos. I've made a lot of videos, some very short ones and some long ones uh, on pronunciation lessons. You can see me uh, teaching and also talking about sounds. Here's my book. And uh, if you'd like a holiday, come to Alexandria or Cambridge or Oxford or London and um, take part in one of my uh, intensive workshops. Meanwhile, thank you for attending. Um, good luck. Uh, take courage because we teachers always need courage. Um, and have fun because that's most important. And uh, we really always do need to have fun so that our students can. And remember that you are a VIP, a very important person. The whole world needs to solve some of its problems, and the way is education. And that's why you and I are VIPs. Not well paid, but that makes us even more important. So, thank you for attending. And now, uh, I'm going to read a few of your questions, which I hope you've sent in. If not, please do. And I'll be with you in a moment. Uh, to select some and uh, give some answers. Meanwhile, thank you very much. Bye bye. <clears throat>Hello everybody, um, I wonder if you can hear me. Anyway, this is uh, Adrian back again. And uh, thank you for your questions which have been coming in. I will do my best uh, to respond to them. Uh, the first question I teach in primary school, difficult is choosing the correct accent for teaching kids the correct pronunciation. Well, of course that's understandable. In a way, what I'm saying is, there isn't uh, a correct accent. There are so many English accents these days. What is correct really is that which is comfortably intelligible, comfortably intelligible. So uh, you, can, you can choose, they can choose, they can, you can use your accent, of course, but you can use the accents of the course book. Uh, if you have an accent that you particularly prefer, you can feature that but also you can introduce your students to multiple other accents. There really is not a correct accent unless there is one that you personally much prefer. These days they hear many accents and the main thing is to be comfortably intelligible and to understand those accents. So that's why I'm doing this seminar to look at what it really takes to be comfortably intelligible. And uh, what I'm saying is that um, it is really important for speakers of, of English to recognize that the unstresses are terribly important. Everybody can stress the stressed syllable, but in English, there's something different going on, and that is the unstresses. So a good place uh, to begin uh, to learn this is with vocabulary. 
Uh, one question here is, are you saying stress is more important than unstress? Well, I'm not saying it's more important, but I'm saying that without unstress, it's very hard to have stress. Um, and this is much more so in English than in other uh, languages. And a good place uh, to do this uh, is with teaching vocabulary. And this is another question. How does this connect with teaching vocabulary? What I'm saying is that um, connecting with unstress can begin with vocabulary teaching. That is a wonderful place to begin. And you all have to teach vocabulary. You all have to teach the stress for the vocabulary, because if you do not teach the stress for vocabulary, the words become unrecognizable. If I say uh, a banana, you don't understand banana. Uh, or if I say paquet, you don't understand packet. Uh, or if I say uh, potato, you don't understand potato. You see, the thing is, uh, in English especially, the unstresses say so much. And if you uh, stress the unstresses, you, you may not be understood. So vocabulary is a good place to start. If you take a three-syllable word, someone here wrote uh, the word journalist. Well, in English, it's journalist. It's on the first syllable, journalist. Or the word presenter, that's on the second syllable, presenter. But if I stress on the first syllable, presenter, or uh, journalist, I say journalist, it's kind of pretty odd for anybody to understand. So uh, vocabulary is a really good place, a really cool place to start work uh, with um, on stress. Uh, it's marked, it's in the dictionary. It's very clear in the dictionary, which is the stress syllable. It's a given, uh, which is the syllable that is stressed. And the other ones are unstressed. Now we'll usually have the sound uh or e. Not always, but usually. So, uh, and the mechanism of stressing and unstressing in vocabulary is pretty much the same mechanism as stressing and unstressing in connected speech. Even if you don't particularly like uh, the idea of working with connected speech, then certainly you can still do this with vocabulary. A question here deals with intonation. How can we teach intonation? Well, uh, my view is this. Um, intonation will enter the picture when the student is ready to really connect with their own meaning. Intonation comes from the meaning. It comes from your uh, relationship with what you're saying and, of course, your relationship to the uh, person you're speaking to. And in order to prepare for intonation, you do need to have the, uh, the words phrased into phrases, like I'm speaking now, words and phrases. Uh, you also need to have the words connected together. And you also need to have the stresses and unstresses. Once those things happen, as I demonstrated in that text, then it's very much easier for a student to bring in intonation quite naturally. So that's why I recommend doing this. And you can do it with any text. Uh, another question here is, can you do this with any text? Yes, absolutely you can. You can even do it with, <laughs> you can even do it with a phone book yeah, or a newspaper um, or numbers. You can really do it with any text at all. And um, there are just these few steps. Number one, what are the sense groups? Step one. Step two, where are the stresses, the main stresses that we want to bring out? Number three, where are the unstresses, which is really everything else? Uh, and it can be helpful in the case of English to look for the sound schwa, since 50 or 60 percent of unstresses is going to be that one sound, the smallest sound in English. Uh, the next step is to connect the words together and then to speak, to feel the meaning and to speak. So yes, you can do it with any text at all. And um, I recommend doing it with texts either that you or your students want to bring in, for example, little things from a reader or little poems that you might be doing, or simply use the texts that are in your course book, because then you are recycling the vocabulary, recycling the grammar, and revisiting uh, everything about the text, but from a new point of view. Someone here says, how can I uh, um, teach uh, link pronunciation to uh, physicality? 
Here's a little exercise that you can do. I do it with all my students on the first day. I, I say to them, now, we're going to, I'm going to take you on a little journey inside your mouth. And it, you'll find your tongue. Imagine that your tongue is a leaf, a leaf in a forest. And imagine that this leaf in the forest is touching some trees which are growing up. And this, these trees are your teeth at the bottom. And with your tongue, you can feel the teeth at the bottom. Well, this leaf feels these trees inside your mouth. And strangely, there are also some trees growing downwards from the top. And you can feel with this leaf, your tongue, these trees growing down from the top, your top teeth. And then you can say, and with this leaf, it also touches the sky, which is the hard bit at the top of your mouth between the teeth. And if this leaf goes right to the back of the mouth, it finds a soft bit, sort of soft and marshy. And then if this leaf goes down to the bottom between the trees that are standing upright at the bottom of the mouth, there's another soft, squelchy, marshy bit. And uh, right at the front of this, if you open the mouth, there's a window and then the light shines in. And I just do this little activity which helps students just to reconnect with the mouth. And once they've reconnected with the mouth and what's in there, it's so much easier to begin to see that pronunciation is a physical activity, not a sort of blind hope for the best mental activity. It really is a little simple piece of physicality. Another question says, um, I think this process is difficult for non-mother tongue person. Moreover, students' motivation must be very high. Well, uh, it, I think it partly depends on the enthusiasm of the teacher. But as I said before, start with vocabulary. Everyone needs vocabulary. When you are teaching vocabulary, if it's two syllables or more, there must be a stress and there must be an unstress. So start there. That's just a great place to do it. And help person, help your teachers to see that if they have the stress in the wrong place, it doesn't make any sense. For example, I'm just looking at the question that this uh, that one of you wrote, which says, I think this process is quite difficult for a non-mother tongue person. Suppose we, instead of process, I say process, or instead of difficult, I say difficult, or if instead of mother, I say mother, or person, or moreover, instead of moreover. You know, the, uh, the, these stresses make a very big difference, and students can hear that. Um, when should we do this kind of speaking activity, is another question. Well, my preference is to do this kind of speaking activity little and almost constantly, because once you've done it in an actual exercise in the way I demonstrated, you don't need to keep doing that. You just do it with whatever sentence is in use at the time in the class. So when you have a, let us say, correct answer, that is, it has the, you have the correct words in the correct order, get the students um, to put the stresses in the right place, to join the words together, and say it as a really meaningful flow. So in that way, they are once again rehearsing and repeating the structures and the vocabulary while attending to the physicality. Um, other phys There's a question here which says, where can I find other videos about pronunciation? Well, if you go to my blog at adrianunderhill.com, you will see that there are about 40 short videos on the Macmillan website, which Macmillan has put up um, on YouTube, and you can find them there. Um, and uh, these uh, YouTube activities are um, typically about three or four minutes long on many different subjects. So there are videos there. Uh, there's also on my blog um, the links to these videos. And also there is uh, a, 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 there are a number of about 90 or so uh, short uh, blog posts by me about these kinds of activities that we're talking about here. Uh, a question here says, what levels? Uh, well, it may seem strange to you, but uh, for me, this is all levels, absolutely every level. Of course, the English will differ. Of course, their 
the accuracy will differ, um, the, the texts will differ, but the principle is the same. Whatever they've got, whatever they've got, uh, help them to stress the stressed syllables, unstress the unstressed syllables, join the words together, and have little pauses. So they're speaking in short phrases. At the end of each phrase, they can pause and think, and it becomes much easier to listen to and much easier to speak. And it's quite natural. So it, it, I know it's surprising to say this is not an advanced activity. This is an activity for every single level from, from I should say, beginner. And in fact, even native speakers would benefit from this exercise. Everybody should be doing this. Um, let's see. I think I've touched on a number of these questions here. Hi, hi, Adrian. Oh, yes. Hello there. Hello. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So we're out of time now. In fact, I think yeah, I've answered. I'm most afraid. Of Sorry to interrupt you. That's all right. Thank I think you. I've finished the questions anyway. <laughs> yes. So that was really great. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, I just want to say to everybody that um, I will be at a workshop uh, sponsored by uh, Macmillan in, in Bolzano uh, at the Free University on the 27th of April. Maybe you can say something about that, uh, Sylvia. Yes, yes, definitely. Actually, thank you for reminding it. Yes, so Adrian will be a guest speaker in a, uh, at the university in Bolzano next 20, 27th of April. Uh, so the conference actually will will occur for the full day, and uh, our um, Italy Macmillan manager will be there. So Casimir will be there with a stand. So you can actually go and ask questions to Casimir, and of course you will have the opportunity, the chance to meet. The famous, you know, Adrian Underhill, then. And I'll be very happy to meet each of you who is a VIP, doing your best to make the world a better place through your teaching. Thank you, then, Adrian. I know it has been, for Italian teachers, actually, the, you know, the, the, the accent, the pronunciation can be very tricky sometimes because our syllable, syllables are always stressed. So some of the comments from teachers actually say, this could be very hard for us in Italy. However, I'm pretty sure that all your tips will be very welcome and used in classroom. Thank you. I know how much you like stress in Italian. <laughs> <laughs> so thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Adrian, again. Much appreciated. And okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Arrivederci. Buona serata.